Welcome to Badass Lady Folk. I'm your host, Christine Stoddard. And today I'm so happy to have my guest, Carissa Pignatelli, here. <laughs> Hello, guys. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, and we also have a precious doggo, yeah. Prince. Hi, Prince. He's getting a little shy, but hey, good to be here, little guy. <laughs> this is the first time I've had a dog in the studio. All right, well, I'm happy to be your first then. <laughs> So, Carissa, <laughs> yeah, get comfy, Prince. I see the, some paw action. Yeah, every so often he's just like, what am I doing? And now he's uh, like, all right, I'm going to stay with mommy. <laughs> yeah. So, Carissa, you are an actress, a model, a writer. You are also a nurse. Uh, yes, I am. I like to think I wear many hats. <laughs> yeah. So, how is it that you decided to become a registered nurse? Because that's really where I want oh. to focus today. Well, um, the thing was, for years, I thought about doing something in the sciences, and um, I wanted to do something that was going to help people. And initially, I didn't think I could do anything like that. I remember at once, I at one point, I did business for a little bit. I did Academy of Finance at one point, and it was nice to know I could do it, but I just, I just didn't like it. And then at one point, I'm like, you know what? Might as well go for broke. Let's just, let's just go for it. And so many years later, I've been here, and. Uh, I actually looked back and I'm like, oh, God, I've been a nurse for just over 10 years now. So it worked out. <laughs> so how do you juggle being a nurse with all of your creative work? Uh, honestly, planners help. <laughs> I actually have something that um, I took off right before we started filming. It's a snap bracelet, but you can actually write on it. So your little to-do list. So any type of reminder, I've used my phone. Um, time management is the big thing. I don't always succeed. There's been times where I've had things get double booked. Like, it's happened. And well. But <laughs> to be honest with you, I like to think that, you know, we all have different parts of ourselves. And I think and that's another thing nursing has taught me that, you know, we might see someone as a patient that's sick, but someone else that comes to visit them may see them as a parent. They may see them as a friend. And sometimes it's hard to see someone in a different position, you know. Hmm. You mentioned your desire to care for others. Mm -hmm. So where do you think that desire came from? You know, that's a good question because I'm not totally sure. I I can't ever remember a time in my life where I was like, you know, I didn't care about somebody. Even when <laughs> – I no, no, ironically, um, this is going to sound so terrible. I remember when I was bullied, um, my father told me that if somebody, like, tries to, you know, tries to razz you in any way – he was he was very old school. He was like, you punch them back. And I was like, well, what happens? Like, I, you know, my, my worry was like, you know, I cared what happened to them. And my dad had to go swimming. He's like, honey, these people don't care about you. Like, he had to kind of put that into perspective for me. So um, I'm really not sure where it came from, to be honest. But I, I think I was always kind of this way. So maybe that's why I always had it in the back of my head before I actually went for it, you know? <laughs> yeah. What was nursing school like for you? Very tough. Um, I went to the College of Staten Island, and um, anyone who has been there knows that you start out with a large class, and then by the time graduation happens, the class has dwindled considerably. <laughs> um, and I know why they do that. They want to make sure all their graduates pass uh, the nursing exam. But I've also realized in more recent times, I think they also want to weed out the people that think, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a certain job. I'm going to get paid. Because, look, you know, we do have job security as given – with what happened with the pandemic, but also, you know, you work very hard for that and you are dealing with people's lives. So I think a lot of times, uh, you know, because I've seen it a few times where I've seen some people that clearly just wanted to go into healthcare for money. And you could tell, especially with their bedside manner. And look, I think of it this way. Somebody's already scared being in the hospital, whether it's for themselves or for their family. You don't want to make it worse. You have to have, like, at least a shred of empathy to know, like, hey, um, what I say matters and what I do matters. Like, quite literally, if I mess up, if I make a mistake, it's going to affect somebody else, you know? How would you describe a good bedside manner? Uh, definitely patience. Uh, patient for the patient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but no, I, I can't tell you how many times where initially I had a patient that was very frustrated with their situation. Sometimes they would be a little testy. And, you know, I get it. They don't have a lot of control of their situation. So very often, you know, you get the brunt of it at first. But sometimes I just take it in stride. I just don't even take it personal. And then after a while, sometimes they do open up a bit. And a lot of times you do have to listen and say, you know, let them say what they got to say, <laughs> you know. Um, so definitely listening, definitely patience is one of them. And on occasion, a sense of humor, because there's been times um, if I know that I can, I'll crack a joke with a patient and just make them laugh for a little bit. And I like doing that, too. <laughs> How would you say, sorry to mention the pandemic, no, but no, you brought okay, it up okay. and you are yeah. a nurse. And 
I've got to. It was an interesting time in my life. Believe me. (laughs) Yeah, believe me. (laughs) Yeah. So how has your life changed in the past three years? Ooh, okay. Uh, I'm letting you know right now, this is probably going to get heavy pretty quick. So, okay, great. Yeah. That's um, why we have a precious puppy in the studio. <laughs> yeah, so I'm probably going to end up cuddling him in a minute. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it changed in a lot of ways. Um, I think I had more friends prior to the pandemic. Uh, I also was in a serious relationship prior to the pandemic. And, um, you know, I think those were the big, big two things because I... Uh, Unfortunately, there was a lot of people that I realized their true colors during the pandemic. Uh, Now, not to bring up politics so much, like um, I used to joke that I wasn't a super political person or I think looking back, what I probably should have said was I don't like to offend or divide people. You know, Mm -hmm. I like to I would rather bring people together. That's always been my motive. And I realized, uh, well, let me start by saying um, I always kind of kept my political opinions to myself because when I'm at work, like, I want people to be comfortable around me. Mm. And if they want to think that I'm one way, fine, I'll let them think that. Um, (laughs) uh, But it's just, you know, I figured I wouldn't want somebody to look down on me for my opinions, my politics or whatever. So I tried to give everybody that courtesy. And then I unfortunately realized with the pandemic, not everybody was going to do the same for me. And I also noticed that there were quite a few people that while I was going to work and putting people in body bags, I had people complaining about wearing a cloth mask or the regular surgical mask just to walk through a restaurant to the back outdoor room and claiming their rights were being denied. And look, I I get the whole political aspect of it. Fine. But I knew certain friends were going out of my life in particular because one friend that I said, hey, look, I've had to do X, Y, Z during the pandemic. I'm depressed. Like, I'm not holding it together. I am not okay. She did not acknowledge it whatsoever. She just went to, oh, what's going on with the vaccine? What's going on with this? And I was, I bit my tongue (laughs) and I wanted to just scream, look, I'm not going to be your ammo for your next Facebook argument. And at that point, and that was not the first time that happened. I also remember there was another friend in particular. And the worst part is I tried to be positive. Hmm. Um, I also deleted Snapchat because of this. (laughs) Um, I had a friend that... uh, you know, we, we mainly communicated on Snapchat. And I remember at one point she asked how I was doing and tried to be positive. I said, ah, oh, you know, it's this is after the first wave in the summertime. Uh, she asked how I was doing. And I said, well, you know, it's been a little rough, but uh, people are starting to get a little bit better, I guess, because it's summertime and people aren't on top of each other. And I said, you know, um, one good thing about this pandemic is certain strains of the flu have been eradicated because we've all been covering up. And again, tried to be happy. And she writes back, and I swear, I actually had to sit and read it over and over because I could not believe she responded this way. She goes, when are you going to stop pretending that this wasn't all the government's plan to muzzle us? And then she starts going off about how, oh, I know someone here. I know someone here. And I remember putting my phone down. Like, I actually had to go like, oh, don't flip out. Don't flip out. And later on, I did respond to her. I said, look, um, you asked me how I was doing. I'm sorry if you didn't like the answer. (laughs) no I meant it I wasn't even trying to be like dismissive or anything I just kind of felt like you asked sorry I gave you an honest response but yeah I I had a lot of treatment like that and I'm so sorry thank you Uh, (laughs) clearly not a good friend uh well that's the thing I realized there were I didn't have as many friends as I thought and um I also had a relationship where I think my my ex-partner like, I don't have any ill will towards this person anymore. Like, we, we've we actually, I don't want to say we're friends, but we're definitely, like, if we run into each other, like, we don't hate each other anymore, which is a good thing. But I realized that his politics became more important than me mm. in regards to everything going on with the mask, the vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. And I also remember um, it brought up a lot of other issues that I did not think initially were important, but I realized too little too late were. Mm. Uh, so that was a big change for me as well. You know, um, also I think at one point it actually got me to a point where I kind of hated nursing at one point, which Mm. I was so frightened that I got to that point because that used to be anytime something was going wrong in my life, I felt like, well, if I can't help myself, let me help someone else. And sometimes it did help, help me. And it was almost like my safe space was taken away, Mm. you know, and I think that was kind of something, but it did kind of force me, believe it or not, to focus on my other hats my other passions because 
you know, I realized to live a full life, you have to do a little more than just one thing. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So it was some hard lessons. I think that was the biggest change for me, you know. What were some of the ways that people in your life did show you compassion and empathy for your career and the mm -hmm. fact that you were probably exhausted all the time? <laughs> um, you know, thankfully, that was that was another good thing. Um, I did meet some new friends that I'm still very close with now. I may not have as many friends, but, you know, quality over quantity. You get the idea here. Um, I can't tell you uh, how many times where I had uh, my good friend Maria. She's also a nurse. Uh, she she very often would sit and talk with me on the phone because uh, she lives a little further away from me now. But sometimes just sitting and listening. Mm -hmm. You don't really have to do much. Um, occasionally you want to treat me to a cup of coffee, a cup of tea like, or something. That's all I need. I'm a cheap date, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's just like the little things. Um, they may seem little, but they're really not. When someone's really depressed and, you know, they, they don't feel like getting out of bed, they don't feel like doing anything. If you say, hey, I'll come to you or, hey, maybe later, let's, let's go somewhere. I'll take you. If we want to leave later, you leave. That's really all you need, you know, and it's, again, may seem very simple, but it, it made the biggest impact to me, you know. Yeah, I've seen all these stories yeah. about people leaving health care, mm -hmm. whether they were doctors, nurses, PAs, something else. Yeah. Was that something that you seriously entertained at any point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Part of me, I mean, now I think because things are a little better, I don't I don't really want to leave like I want to anymore. I do think that I'm more willing to say no when people say, like, hey, do you want to do some extra shifts, though? <laughs> um, but I, I did seriously think about it, but it never came to that, I think, because I don't want to say, like, oh, I've never done anything else, but I really didn't know where I would go. Um, I did consider maybe going back to school and doing some sort of teaching or doing, uh, believe it or not, I considered uh, doing a... I forgot the proper name for it, but basically uh, you do co you help with uh, cosmetic surgeons and things mm. like that. Like you would be the one that's injecting Botox and things like that. Uh, again, it's escaping me what the proper title is, but I was considering doing... Esthetician? Yes, esthetician nurse. Thank yeah. you. Um, I was considering doing that at one point, um, which eh, maybe I'll, I'll think about. It's very expensive to get the certification, though. Um, but I was considering stuff like that. Like maybe there are other avenues of nurses uh, nursing that I could do. Um, now, thankfully, there is. So I still kind of teeter with that now. Um, I don't work as often as I normally do in the hospital. Uh, I pulled back some of my hours a bit. Um, I have been doing infusion nursing. So I'm still I'm still getting to take care of people and I'm still getting to help people. Um, but that's also something I do want to bring up. I think what a lot of healthcare workers do is that they think their identity is being a nurse, being a doctor, mm. being EMT, whatever. But I personally think that our identity is helping people. And I think we'll find ways to do that, whether we stay in healthcare or not, you know. Ooh. Did you find enough time to sit and reflect and write some of your poetry or pursue your creative endeavors when it was really like that first year or so? Or was it more like go, 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 sleep when I can? <laughs> um, you know what? Actually, reflecting, I don't think I really, I really did as much writing and creative adventures as I wanted as I wanted to. I did a little bit, but uh, also at the time, and this was something I didn't mention with my life changing. Um, my grandfather passed away, who I was very, very close with, and it wasn't of COVID. Um, he had an issue with his lungs to begin with, um, but I was very close with him, and I have to laugh because I found myself you know, having more in common with my 97 year old grandfather than my parents, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, but he was also very comforting with things. And, uh, there were times he even admitted, he's like, you know, I, I never lived through something like this. You know, I really mm. don't have anything to say, but you know, he would always like, you know, make sure I had something to eat or, you know, <laughs> but, um, but I remember losing him also was, I think another reason why I, I kind of started shutting down too. You know, mm. I actually remember one of the things that they did in my hospital was they had this thing called Lavender Room. And I know they meant well. Oh, no. <laughs> it literally was an office room. Like, it, it, you could tell it was normally used for, like, a conference room. Like, it had a big table in it with these big office chairs. And I remember there was a lady in there. Like, she was very young. Um, she had dark chocolate, coloring books, and tea bags. And it wasn't even the nice tea. It was the tea they had in the cafeteria. <laughs> and... I remember saying to her, because um, this was something that really bothered me. I was like, you know, I want to see my grandfather. 
Hmm. You know, well, like I knew I was going to sacrifice weekends, holidays, all that stuff. But, you know, my grandfather doesn't have much time left. I should be with him. And the girl was just like, well, thank you for your sacrifice. And I know she didn't know what to say, because what can you say to that? But I wanted to scream, yeah, but this was not the sacrifice I thought I was going to make, you know? Um, pardon me for yelling. No, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting a little passionate, you know? <laughs> But, um, but I did at one point, I was, you know, I did start seeing my grandfather, even though I was working on a COVID floor, because I realized, like, he he was going to go either way. And I, I, I wanted to have all the time I could with him. Mm. You know, there were times we sat outside. There were times, you know, um, when he was really getting sick, it was almost like, you know what, we can't send him to the hospital because then we're not going to see him again. You know, but, um, but yeah, that was, oof. Oh, God. Sorry. That, that, that's going to get me in a weird no, place. No, I mean, I'm sorry for your loss, and thank you for sharing that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What are other sorts of tone deafness that you've seen in the industry? You mentioned this lavender room, which seems like <laughs> it was designed for three-year-olds, not mm. working adults during a pandemic. <laughs> uh, that's that's also another thing. I... Uh, I, I finally, after a good three years, for I'll uh, use that little coloring book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just remember looking at it, and I'm like, yeah, because the coloring book's going to solve all my problems. Um, oh, God, there was so much. Um, I think one of the things that they told us to do when we were begging for more supplies was they said, God, I can't believe we did this. They told us to put our mask, uh, because we only had so many N95s, they told us to put our mask dirty side down in a brown paper bag and then roll it shut, and then reuse it again. Hmm. Yeah. And yet, when Jayco, the hospital accreditation company, would come and check on us before the pandemic, they would yell at us if we had, like, a glass of water or a water bottle on our nurse's cart because we were thirsty. That was a problem. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> things things like that. Um, so, there were so many hard to name. I think because um, that was another thing we, we fought a lot for in our union. We wanted more staff. Like there were times we didn't even fight for extra pay. We were just like, look, we need more help. That's kind of all, you know, all we're asking for here, you know. And also, can you let us leave for more than a few days, like just to recover if we get COVID? Because unfortunately, I did catch COVID. And what? Yeah. Um, I caught it later on. Um, later on, it was um, August of 2022, I caught it. And... I'm not quite sure how, but I kind of figure, you know, workplace, you know, you know, workplace hazard, I guess. But um, uh, it, it, it knocked me out. It really knocked me out. And the worst part was I was I had just scheduled to get my freaking booster. And I was like, <gasps> wow, is timing so freaking bad. Oh. So I was like, you know, I was vaccinated, obviously, but it was just like I said, I, ugh. I put off getting my booster. I was like, oh, all right, I'll do it next week. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And that didn't quite happen. So so how long were you allowed to take off from work? Um, well, I was allowed at that point. They were allowing people five days. And if you had a negative test, then you could come back. Um, the good part was one of my friends was telling me, like, different ways to kind of, um, who also worked in the hospital, different ways to kind of prolong it a bit. So I had a little more time to recover. So I was able to take a week off, thank goodness. Um I swear to God, I hope I never have to take Paxlovid again because that was that antibiotic tastes terrible. I was just about yeah. to ask. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just getting over COVID and I did take Paxlovid and it was a whole uh, delicious so adventure. Oh, it tastes terrible. <laughs> how did you how did you deal with COVID though? Because I, I I don't know why, but the fever was always worse at night, maybe because I was actually like I had to sit and think about it. I never had a fever, so oh, I caught you. it twice. <laughs> And neither time I had a fever, but I lost my appetite. Mm. My sense of smell went away almost completely. My sense of taste was totally distorted. Mm. I'm a huge coffee drinker, and I couldn't stomach coffee oh, wow. because it just tasted so nasty. Mm. Everything tasted <laughs> nasty. And I love to eat, too. <laughs> um, and even still, like, I've been testing negative for a little over a week, mm. about a week and a half. And it's super frustrating that someone who normally has a healthy appetite yeah. and snacks just a little for fun. <laughs> like I, I have to remind myself to eat because I'm still, and it messes with my energy because all oh, the energy was, yeah, yeah hours will go by. Right. And I've realized even at this point, not technically being sick anymore. Mm. Oh, 
it's been eight hours since I ate. <laughs> like I should eat something. That's why I'm exhausted. <laughs> the appetite definitely changed, but I, I'm not sure if it was straight up from COVID or the fact that I just felt like it was a little harder for me to breathe. Like if I mm. did something, like if I tried to, let's say, clean my place, I had to sit down after a while. I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta breathe, you know? <sighs> but, um, I cannot tell you how – well, one of my friends was really good to me. Um, she dropped off, like, a little care package, and Aww. I remember asking her. I was like, could I get Ralph's Ices in there? I feel like I need something cold because it was in the summer when I got it. Um, and this may sound weird, but the only thing that made me feel better with the, with the fevers was I actually would take a cold bath. Yeah. Like, I would just fill the bath with cold water, and I would just sit there, and that was the only thing that would help. Um, but I remember she got me like a whole bunch of ices and stuff. I remember having like a seven 11 Slurpee because I just need something cold down my throat. So that helped me a lot. Thank goodness. But mm. yeah. <laughs> Do you think that the average person really understands and appreciates the sacrifice and sacrifices plural that um, healthcare workers made during the pandemic? You know what? I'm not sure only yeah. because, um, one of the things that I, I felt was very, as you put, tone deaf was, do you remember when everyone started protesting about um, about reopening things and whatnot? Yeah. Now, look, I, I get it. People have to, you know, pay their bills and stuff. I understand people that were coming from that. But um, I remember actually on Staten Island, where I'm from, there was a bar that is actually now closed because they have so many legal fees that they have to deal with. Ooh. Um, I forget the name of the place right now, but, you know. Because they reopened too early when they uh, weren't allowed or what happened? Well, they, they, I swear to God, they wrote that it was a, quote, autonomous zone and that people should be able to make the choice to come in or not. And, again, I, there was literally no reason for them to do that. They, I think, honestly, <laughs> they just wanted the attention. And, um <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it just got real ugly real quickly. And I remember saying to somebody, like, look, I, I get the whole, you know, oh, how come one side of the block can open with the other? I understand what you're saying with that. But, you know, obviously there's got to be a dividing line somewhere. And um, and if you want to go further, one of the things that we were telling people to do when we said stay at home is that we just want our hospitals not to be overwhelmed, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really kind of what it comes down to. Um, you know, you could still obviously do things, obviously be cautious about it, but, you know, we were trying just to not have our hospitals get overwhelmed. And I think this is more of a systemic problem. So obviously I can't really offer solutions with that cause it's, it's bigger than me. But, uh, I just remember yelling at one time to myself cause there was nobody that listened to me at that point. I just wanted to scream. I wish I had your problem where I was upset that I couldn't go out to my favorite bar. I have to, <laughs> I have to go to work tomorrow morning. Thanks. You know, <laughs> so I think it's stuff like that I think people don't get where we see a lot of horrible things. I remember actually um, I, I actually saw this one gentleman who uh, lost both his legs in a car accident. He was 23. And the worst part of it all was that he wasn't even driving. He was a passenger and the driver screwed up royally and it affected someone else. Um, and I do think that also things like that also affected me. It showed me that, you know, sometimes bad things can happen and it's not even the person's fault that gets affected by it. You know, and I think that's also another thing, the the common folk, not, well, maybe not common folk is a bad <laughs> name, but the folks that are not in healthcare don't quite get, you know, everybody was like, oh, well, it should be my choice. Well, yeah, but your choice affects someone else, mm -hmm. you know, so you do have to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. So what are some other sources of inequity that you see in the field? I hear a lot about gender differences, mm -hmm. nurses getting put down because it is a feels uh, a career that's heavily mm -hmm. female. Yeah. Um, honestly, I notice when it comes to, um, to women in healthcare, I think the big issue that we ran into, um, like I was saying before, when the union was really fighting for our healthcare, um, nursing in the beginning was not the respected career it is now. It used to be just something, you know, Florence Nightingale's time. It was something that women that were in prison got later on to get re, um, uh, put out back in society again. When Florence Nightingale actually first started becoming a nurse, her family didn't want her to. No, I, I swear. Like, um, no, I, I, sw I swear. I wish I wish I was making this yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the only reason why nursing kind of became more of a science was because uh, Florence came from a pretty prominent rich family. She had a statistics degree, and she was able to prove, hey, you know when you wash your hands, people don't die as much. <laughs> For layman's terms, obviously. Right. Um, and in more recent times, like let's say – 
40s, 50s, a lot of times women would become nurses because they were just kind of making extra money. They weren't fully supporting themselves. And that was just the dynamic of how things were at the time. But as you could tell, now we have women that are the head of the households. We have women that are just supporting themselves, single parents, all these things. We also have a lot of male nurses. So it's not it's not as female run as it used to be. It's still prominently women, but there's there's a lot of men that are getting into the field as well. Um, so I think for that reason, there's been there's been times where I've had jobs as a nurse where I didn't get health care. And Oof. yeah, no, it was it was pretty bad. I remember there was um, there was a school I used to work in. I wasn't hired by the Board of Ed. I was hired by a staffing company. And I make that distinction for a reason. I remember when I was telling someone I have to get a new job because I, you know, be, uh, because of that, they were like, oh, well, why is that? It's a Board of Ed job. And I'm like, no, it's not. That's the huh. point. Um, That's so sleazy. It's absolutely sleazy. Um, I was a college graduate. I did everything expected of me, and yet I still had to be under mommy and daddy's health care. Um, honestly, if um, the Affordable Health Care Act hadn't happened, I would have been screwed. So um, that helped me a lot, you know. Uh, but when I got into the hospital, that's when I finally had health care of my own. And I, wow. I felt so much relief. But my point with that is... I think that's uh, something that causes a lot of inequity, probably because it started out as, you know, a woman's career. And as I said before, it used to be something where married women would take as opposed to women that are supporting themselves. Hmm. Um, I've also noticed that there's a lot of women that kind of dismiss their pain. I'm not quite sure where that comes from, but I have noticed that a lot of women are like, oh, I don't want to bother you. I don't want to bother mm. you. Um, I wonder if it's more of a cultural thing because I do see it across the board. There's... Um, Especially uh, mothers, they, they don't want to make a big deal out of certain things. You know, I see that to be um, something that's very prominent, believe it or not. Um, but on the flip side, I see um, men tend to have more problems with mental health. Hmm. And I think that's, again, more of a cultural thing where, you know, we have a lot of cultures that want these guys to be super masculine and super dominant all the time. And let's be honest, nobody's like that all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or should be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you have feelings. You're human, and you should absolutely take the time to say, hey, if I'm not okay, let me go see somebody. Let me talk to somebody. Um, I actually remember there was one gentleman that came into – well, I, my first hospital job was actually a psychiatric nurse, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Ah. <laughs> um, so I, I remember one of the gentlemen that I took care of, he came in for depression, and it turns out it all started – like it really started to spiral out of control when he lost his job. Hmm. And I remember him crying to me because he was like – you know, I can't support um, my family. I can't support myself. And I realized how much he tied his worth to being a provider. Yeah. So um, and also I noticed a lot more men actually uh, would attempt suicide, which um, I didn't quite see that coming until I started working in mental health. So um, and again, I think the reason for that is for so long we've had this very misconstrued mentality that men have to be this way. Women have to be that way. But I think of it this way. We're all human, regardless of genders you, you've you born as, identify as, or what have you. You know, we're human. We have emotions. We break down sometimes. And it doesn't make you less of a person for that. It doesn't decrease your value. You know, if you need help, physical or mental, that's when you come to folks like me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and no judgment, by the way. Like, we all, we all have issues sometimes, you know? Yeah, of course. Well, speaking of vulnerability, mm -hmm. now seems like the perfect segue <laughs> to your poem. Oh, and I yes. would love, and I'm sure our audience members <laughs> will love to hear you as a writer. All right. Uh, I actually wrote this um, specifically for you guys. <clears throat> this is called Union Nurses Cry. My eyes watched people die. My ears heard their loved ones cry as I was powerless to save them. I'm a nurse, I'm essential, I can be strong and gentle, but even I need help sometimes. We're not asking for wealth here, just better staffing and our own health care as you sit far removed from the madness. We're more than just a job on the side, because days and nights we ride through death and sickness, and with this, we take it home despite our best efforts. We're more than just wives, and if the husbands never arrive, we still get things done. <laughs> And I'm the head of my home, and though I'm alone, I still need to pay my bills. And I take care of everybody. But how can I take care of me when the odds are stacked above? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So can you talk about the process for writing that poem, the impulse? I know you wrote it for <laughs> us. Um, 
Well, one of the reasons why I included the lines about, you know, we're more than wives and that the husbands don't arrive uh, goes back to what I was saying before about how, you know, for a long time, nurses were thought of as like, oh, they're the wife. It's the side job and whatnot. And the dynamic has changed, as I brought up before, where there's a lot of women that are heads of household. Uh, there are a lot of women that are just independently supporting themselves, maybe a child or whatnot. So I wanted to make sure that was brought up that, you know, we're more than just, you know, that side, um, that side character, so to speak. Uh, I also brought up about my eyes and ears hearing people not making it. And hmm. I remember actually even telling a friend of mine who uh, she was working in a burn unit and she was actually having some trouble. And this was even before COVID because um, she saw some really terrible cases. And, yeah. Um, and that's the one thing I will say about working in a burn unit. Um, I had some burn patients come to me when I was uh, working on a med surge unit. Um, they usually would step down from that. You pump them up with a lot of pain medicine and they're still crying. Like burns, wow. like burns are no joke. And also if let's say somebody has burns to their face and their appearance changes, like that's another issue that you have to run into because your appearance does matter and your self-confidence matters as well. And obviously when something like that's changed, you know, you're going to be faced with a lot of issues. Um, so that's also what I was referring to when I talked about, you know, my eyes and my ears hearing all these different things. Um, also, the fact that I think a lot of healthcare workers, we realize that health is wealth. So that's when I brought up mm -hmm. about, you know, we're not asking for extra money. We're asking for help, you know, and a lot of us love what we do, but it's just we can't be in two places at once. And I think that's also what a lot of the um, the higher ups, the uh, folks that are more into the business end that are like, oh, no, you could have you could you could have one nurse to nine patients. That's totally fine. No, Ooh. it's not. Um, and I say that because I actually did have that. Um, and even before the pandemic, um, and I remember wanting to scream so many times where it's like, look, I, I want to be there for everybody, but I can only I can only do so much with right. before I collapse. I'm human. So that was really the big thing of it. Uh, trying to make sure, like, you know, look, we we need help for many different ways. And unfortunately, this is a problem with uh, healthcare. care. Uh, I can definitely say it's true for nurses where we burn out a lot. You know, a lot of times we take care of everybody else. And then by the time it's time to take care of ourselves, we're, we're falling apart. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's very hard for us to manage everybody as well as ourselves, hmm. you know. So we have to sometimes make health care, uh, our own health care priority. And learning that is, it's a process. And I'm still learning it. I still mess up on occasion, you know. Yeah. How would you describe the relationship you and your fellow nurses have with doctors? How can that go? Um, honestly, I've had some doctors where we're very cool with them. Like I could... You know, I could reach out to them and say, hey, uh, this person's doing this again. Can you help me out here? And then I have some that just, they think who they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember um, I had this one doctor. I'm, God, I, I never seem to say his name right because it, it, it was this, like, long Polish name. It was, like, Krischer. Um, Krischer, if I'm saying it correctly. We always just called him Dr. K. Um, like, I actually saw him, like, uh, walk with patients and things like that, like, trying to help them get out of bed and things. And we, we thanked him all the way, um, all for that. Um, we had Dr. Elsway, who was really wonderful. Um, but then we had, like, a few uh, doctors that I, I don't know if they were there because they liked the patients or they just had to do their rotation, you know. Um, but a little kindness does go a long way. There were times I actually, because um, my current floor, one of the one things I don't quite like about it is, uh, for a while, we have uh, residents that were just recently out of school that are learning, and then we have, like, one main doctor. The one main doctor always tells us if we ask him for something like, hey, make sure, call my residents for this. Call my residents. Only call me if it's an emergency, like somebody's dying, because <sighs> I need to get my students to learn. I remember, actually, uh, they recently um, started making us use these. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> Okay. Prince just got excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Are you being a good watchdog? <laughs> so let me get back. To, I'm, <laughs> no, it's okay. Come here. That's Hold what that's second. what we get for having a dog in the studio. But he's also a joy. He's so cute. <laughs> How long have you had Prince? Um, I've had him actually since May, and uh, he's a rescue. And I love this little guy. Um, honestly, I I'm I know obviously this is not totally medically accurate, but I joke that he's also my antidepressant because he has, <laughs> he's made me a hell of a lot happier since I've gotten him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you find yourself needing a dog after actually, all of this? <laughs> actually, yeah, kind of, um, because it was just, um, 
I'll be honest. I, I wanted I wanted a pup for a while, and um, my last dog had passed away, mm. and I was like, you know what? I think I'm ready to try again. Yeah. You know, and um, I have to say one thing is that if you're feeling like you're not motivated to get up and stuff like that, if at least for me, and maybe this comes from the fact that I am a nurse, I I know that hey, if I don't get up, this little guy doesn't eat. This little guy yeah, doesn't yeah. you know get to go outside. So. He's inadvertently made me get some healthier habits, and also it it kind of helps that you know sometimes when uh, you know he'll jump he'll jump on my bed just to like cuddle with me and whatnot. So Aww. yeah, even when I wasn't feeling so good, I remember like he crawled right up to me, so I joked he was my personal heating pad and all that. <laughs> so okay, he's, he's a sweetie. <laughs> Before he got all excited, you were talking about some doctors and lack of bedside manner. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, some of the residents, I remember uh, they implemented uh, this thing called the zebra phone at my job where basically it's an in-network Zebra? Phone. Like yes. the animal? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know why they have that. It's That's just what they call it. So um, with that being said, you can it's an in-network phone where you can text the doctors, other nurses, and things like that. And um, I remember there was a few times I said, hi, excuse me, are you the resident for uh, this patient? Are you following this patient? Uh, because sometimes the residents will swap from different ones. And I said, hey, um, you know, the computer is showing this. And sometimes it's, it hasn't always been accurate, especially if it's new and people change shifts. <laughs> and and I said, hey, you know, are you this patient's uh, uh, resident? Because this is what's happening right now. Can you get them this? And I remember I, I got met with so much attitude. They were just like, no, I'm not that bad. I'm like, I'm Ooh. asking. Why are you like, okay, fine. All right. I'm not even going to fight about it. It's like not worth it. Not worth my breath. So, yeah. Um, so, again, we've got some doctors that were really wonderful. I love working with them. And then there are some where I'm like, oh, great. So I guess it's kind of like anything else, you know? Yeah. <laughs> are there things that you wish more doctors knew about your job as a nurse? Um, well, I think uh, they definitely need to know, like, you know, we're, we're watching them very closely. We try to get to know them as people as well. And um, there are times when, you know, we're on top of you to get certain orders done. It's because maybe my patient's crying in a lot of pain. My patient's worried. I also remember telling this one doctor uh, that I was actually had to had to make a phone call with. I was like, look, the patient's family is right behind me. They need to see you. They're not letting me let this go. Like, you know, very often we, I don't want to say we get harassed, but very often people are very insistent that they want to talk to somebody. They yeah. want answers. And if I can't give it to them, sometimes I'm the one that ends up dealing with it. You know, so when we call you like that, it's not because we want to annoy you. It's, it's because, <laughs> you know, we, we we need a little help and we don't know what else to do. I remember even telling one doctor, I was like, look, I know you're going to tell these patients' family the exact same thing that I said, <laughs> but they want to hear it from you. So I'm just mm. letting you know when you get a chance, come say hi, tell them the same thing I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and why do you think the loved ones want to hear from the doctor? I, I think it's because, again, there's that archaic belief where it's like the doctor knows and does everything. And <laughs> uh, and, and look, no, I, I, I have a lot of respect for doctors. I don't want anybody to think like nurses hate doctors. That is not the case. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're there. We are the ones that document. We're the ones that make sure that we're keeping track of the patients. Now, the doctors, they can diagnose what we're keeping track of. Mm -hmm. And they could also, you know, order certain tests, order certain medications and whatnot. So... I might say, hey, this person is having trouble urinating. Uh, should we consider a Foley? Should we do some tests? Should we do this? And we discuss. Like one of the things we do on my unit is uh, we have rounds in the morning where everybody, nurses included, we are all, we're all involved in it. Um, so uh, whatchamacallit. So with that being said, you know, I think, again, there's this archaic belief that the doctors do everything and that's it. And the nurses yeah. are just here to say hi you know and again not the case <laughs> so what are the ways that you wish the loved ones of patients would interact with nurses differently or or things that we shouldn't do when our our loved ones are in the <laughs> hospital uh number one being mean to me is not making me help your uh help your loved one more mm -hmm. and it, <laughs> no seriously um i cannot tell you how many times where the patient themselves were very nice, but the family was a piece of work. And there were times that I just mentally could not go back into the room. I was like, I'm going to be stuck in there for a long time getting yelled at. And they're going to be asking asking me questions that I don't know the answers to. 
Or if I do tell them, like, hey, I don't have access to that information, I will call someone that does, and I'll see about them getting back to you. I know sometimes it takes a while, because that's another thing. A lot of our, our doctors, our residents, they're taking care of a lot of patients, too. So they're trying to give one patient all their time, and then there's someone else who's like, oh, well, you weren't here for this. Like, yeah, because I was taking care of another patient. <laughs> um, so don't be mean. That's number one. Number two, we are doing our best. We want to take care of your relatives. We want to see them do as best as we possibly can. And um, also, we're human, too. Like, I, I actually remember um, uh, back in 2016, my uncle had passed away in the hospital that I currently work at. Oh, my and, God. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong. Everybody on that unit, they took really great care of him. And, you know, it, it, it was not obviously a happy event, but they, they did their best to make us and make him comfortable. You know, we got into this because we want to help. You know, so we're doing the best we can. Sometimes, again, the odds are stacked against us, so we can't do as much as we want to. But... We really do try. So just don't be mean. Just be accepting. And we're really doing our best. That's all. Are you know? there things that the loved ones of patients can actively do to make things go smoother? <laughs> a um, couple things. Uh, if you want to, like, buy us a coffee, <laughs> we don't mind. Um, I think also um, write down all your questions. And I say this because, number one, it'll be clear and concise because, let's be honest, when we're all frustrated, sometimes we forget what we want to say. Um, also, if you want to write a few things down, um, if I could print something out for you, I will. Um, you could always ask for that. Mm. Uh, like what? What's an example of something? Well, like if you have questions about side effects of medications, if you oh, want to go okay. over medications uh, with me, like that your uh, loved one's taking, I could go over that with you. I can tell you this is for this, this is for that. Um, I may not know every single side effect or every little thing, but I will do my best, to, um, even if I don't know it, to find out for you. Mm -hmm. So write down your questions. Make sure you have an idea of what you want to know. Um, ask for a printout or write it down. It might be a little quicker because sometimes our printers get a little backed up. <laughs> um, so those are definitely things uh, that you could do. And um, if you have anything that, let's say, your loved one takes at home, you can bring it in. We don't mind. Um, a lot of times we have to write a form to say, like, oh, right, look, this person is on this. we got to get approved by pharmacy. But you can do that. That's completely fine to do. Also, take belongings home. And I say that because <laughs> I, I, I had somebody that claimed he lost, like, $400, and we had no record that he had any of that. I, we had somebody else that claimed he, he lost, like, a fine watch of some kind. D don't leave your jewelry here with us. Like, like, take it all home, please. Any stuff like that, take it home. It's you don't want to leave it here because things randomly go missing, you know, and <laughs> some of it not because anybody steals. I remember we had one person that they lost their phone and we found out that while, um, while we, I guess, had stripped his bed and threw away all the linens into the, uh, the washer, um, <laughs> the phone was in there. Oh, bye-bye. <laughs> oh, yeah, and the worst part was we saw the phone, like, going down the street because um because there's a truck that we have to, like, put all the linens in. Well, we don't personally, but um a lot of the transporters do. Um and I remember, like, we, we saw it, like, going over the bridge to the facility to sterilize everything. And we were like, oh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> so <laughs> take all your stuff home, please. <laughs> what are some of the funniest stories you have to share from nursing? Oh, God. Um, oh, there's a few. There's there's, there's a few. But um, psych was always really funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, psych, psych was really funny. I remember, um, oh, God, it's so weird when you actually have to, like, think back and tell it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember I had uh, one patient that was in the TV room when I was working psych, and uh, he was listening to back when Hillary and Trump were going back and forth, and I just remember he goes, this election, it's just two teenagers arguing! <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, all right, you're not wrong. Yeah. So <laughs> I remember that was one of them. Also, um, I, <laughs> I, had, um, I had a patient that... Um, he went walking down the hall, and I don't think he realized his gown was wide open. Oh. And um, and he was just like, no, you girls are really great. Okay, I'm going to get going. And I'm like, sir, sir. And he's like, well, what's wrong? What's wrong? And then, you know, I tied him up, and he goes, well, I was trying to be sexy. And he just, <laughs> like, just laughed it off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, and you also just reminded me, I had a patient that um, he had to get his uh, part of his leg amputated because of uh, diabetes. Hmm. And, um, you know, I was I was doing his dressing, and I'm rolling it up. And at one point, uh, I made a stupid joke because I knew I could. I was like, oh, I'm boring now. The only joint I roll these days is yours. <laughs> and then um, I looked and I said, 
sorry, my sense of humor doesn't get better from here. And he goes, oh, no, that's fine. I'd give up my right leg for that sense of humor. Oh, wait. And I'm like, no! (laughs) Too soon! (laughs) Well, if he's the one saying it. (laughs) I was like, no! And that was the worst thing. Like, he got it just the other day. I was like, no, you just had this! And he's, I was like, it's too soon. He goes, ah, no, it's not. So, yeah, no, you get people with some, with pretty good sense of humor, which is great. (laughs) Oh, and speaking of amputations, I remember um, when I was in psych, we had one patient that um, he had a prosthetic that he walked around with. Um, I forget what led to this, but he he had to get sedated. He was acting very erratically. But when we had to hold him down to give him the medicine, which, again, we don't normally force meds unless it's like the last resort. But he somehow I don't know how he did it, but he wiggled in such a way where he grabbed his prosthetic and he tried to he, he tried to beat us with it during at the time. It was terrible. But when we looked back, we were like. Okay, that's ridiculous. We love it. <laughs> <Like it's... laughs> so you have to laugh at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what are some of the other coping mechanisms that you have for getting through <laughs> tough situations? Um, a lot of humor. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, there are times that in like, lately it's been the pantry for me and a couple of my work buddies. Like we'll we'll go and get some water for ourselves, and we'll be you know if we got to yell about somebody or whatever, we'll do it in there, and then we'll go back out like nothing happened. Um, and more recently, uh, long walks. I absolutely love physical activity. I've gotten into hiking in the past few years. I joke that part for mental health and part because it's a fairly inexpensive hobby. Yeah. Depending on, like, all the stuff that you're buying. Um, I just have a good pair of shoes. I'm good. That's all I need. And my little boy's with me. So, yeah, he's happy about that. So a um, little bit of physical activity. Um, also, that's another reason why I really started pushing myself with uh, writing again because that kind of gets me out of my head. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's another helpful coping mechanism for me. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have to young women or, or even girls who mm-hmm. might be interested in becoming nurses? Um, it is one of those fields where, again, you will have job security. You will definitely help a lot of people. It may not always feel that way, but trust me, you will. Uh, be prepared to work hard because it's not the easiest thing. Uh, but also, if for whatever reason bedside nursing is not your thing, because it is pretty intense, mm-hmm. you have other options too. I've I've seen nurses even go into um, law offices where they are trained to read uh, medical documents and help translate it to some of the other people that are in court and things like that. So you have options for this career. Definitely worth doing. It is a fun career when you get to the point where like you find your niche. You mm-hmm. know. Uh, so I think my advice would be like if you feel like you want to do it, you might as well go for it. Just be aware that your decisions do affect other people. So just have some empathy and understand that if some people rip on you a bit, it's chances are it's because they're scared or they're frustrated about mm-hmm. their situation. And also, I would say take care of your mental and physical health because they do coincide with one another. And you know, you could also use that to be the example to your patients as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What would you describe as your niche today in nursing? Um, you know, uh, my current floor is, um, it's med surge with a rehabilitation focus. So we tend to get people that let's say they've, um, they had a stroke. We have to make sure they can learn how to feed themselves again and do their normal life. Um, things that they normally would, uh, they broke a hip or whatnot. Um, occasionally we'll get some people that are a little younger because, you know, sickness happens to everybody. Stuff happens. Um, I like being able to sit and talk to somebody and make sure that they know exactly what they're doing, know how to take their medication. And if, let's say, um, let's say they have to do a new regimen or there's a new equipment, piece of equipment or whatnot, I could teach them how to do that. You know, I love, absolutely love doing that. So I kind of joke that I'm like half nurse, but half teacher also, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. And I also don't even mind like precepting anytime like we have some of the nursing students pop in, you know? So I, I, again, I think my my niche is really that, just making sure that people are taught and more importantly understand because this is something they're going to probably have to deal with for, if not their whole lives, for a long time. So I think definitely teaching is a bit of it for me too. You know? <laughs> yeah. And how would you say your niche has changed? I mean, you talked about psych before, mm-hmm. but why have you gone to different parts of the field? Well, um, I really did enjoy psychiatric. The only problem I would say is that uh, it was my first nursing job. So <laughs> a lot of my a lot of my clinical skills, um, you know, my actual hands on stuff was not really where I wanted to be. 
And at one point I was like, oh, you know what? I could do this for the rest of my life. And then things kind of changed. And I was like, you know, if I don't start changing, I'm going to be stuck and I won't have a choice for anything else. Hmm. So I did go onto a med search floor, which was, I jokingly called it the baptism of fire because (laughs) it was, it was rough. It was very, very rough. Um, I did learn a lot about managing my time. That was, that was a big one. But I started to move around because I realized when you move around a bit, you start learning more things. And something that I still kind of struggle with, but I realize, again, it's an ongoing process. You have to sometimes get comfortable with being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because that's how you learn. That's how you grow. And, you know, if you stay in the same place, like, yeah, you're always comfortable. You're always, you know, where everything is and what to do. But you can't be afraid to make a mistake in the sense of, like, all right, I don't quite know how this works. Like, you can ask a question if you're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's okay. But get as much experience as you possibly can. That's really one of the big reasons why I changed. I wanted to make sure I knew as much as I could. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you feel like your confidence has changed mm-hmm. a lot, a little? How has it changed? And do you think any <laughs> of that is tied to... to I mean, really everything to being a woman, Mm -hmm. to just getting older, living through life. Well, um, I think my confidence, I don't want to say it increased, but I think it's at a safe level because um, there are times I still knock myself down. I know I shouldn't. But I've realized, again, with the experience that I've gotten is that, you know, we are all people. You know, we all have emotions. We all deal with things. Like I recently was talking to somebody about um, he he went through some issues with somebody. I don't want to go into it. That's his business. But, um, he was under the impression that certain things favored more women. And I was, yeah, (laughs) I love, Oh, that's, that's, that's always fun. But I was, I was explaining to him. I said, well, well, that's kind of what we're talking about with, uh, the patriarchal system being hurtful for everybody, because I'm pretty sure you're more than just a money machine. That's, you know, providing for the person you're with. And, I even remember having to explain to him because he started saying things like, oh, girls only want guys that make a lot of money. Girls only want guys that are six feet tall. And I said, well, let me tell you something. Those women that you speak of, they're not looking for love. They're looking for status. So that's number (laughs) one. You know, anybody that's just looking for those kinds of things, they're looking for status. Um, But people that are looking for genuine connections, like they care about the connection. They're not they don't care that much about your job. You know, we'll work with each other, you know, (laughs) but um. I think it's shown me that everybody has their own issues. So there's times I've learned not to take things personal Mm -hmm. uh, because you can't. You're going to go crazy if you do. Uh, I think being a woman, it's shown me that I'm a little stronger than I think. Um, Because I remember when I was younger, not not to say I was always afraid of everything, but I don't think I was as confident with my abilities. I don't think I was as confident with my voice. Um, I'm definitely more willing to stand up for myself and stand up for others now. You know, that's something I think I've definitely already are saying. And I also think it's made me count my blessings a bit more because um, especially when I was in psych, I remember there were times that I would think like, oh, I'm I'm a terrible person. I have a horrible oh. life. You know, like we all spiral at times. But then when I was looking at some people with the problems they were going through, I'm like, no, I would take my problems over. Anyway. <laughs> and, and again, not trying to be funny, but it's just like it kind of made me say like, no, I've got a home, I have this, I have that. Like, it may not be a lot, but, you know, I'm working with somebody who doesn't have a home to go to. I'm working with someone who's uh, the person in their life that's supposed to be there for them, actively abuse them. Like, it made me realize, like, no, I I could do this. And also I had to make sure that they could do it as well, you know. Hmm. Barton, I went off on a tangent there a bit. but. (laughs) (laughs) So what are some of your hopes for the next year, two, three years, whatever this post-pandemic period is? Um, Well, I want to do a few things for myself. I actually recently wrote down a few goals. Uh, One of them is uh, I have actually uh, a couple art projects I'm working on, and I want to make sure that I get them, you know, some of my writing published. I want to get some of my art published. A friend of mine, um, I've been working with her. We've been, I've been learning how to paint, and um, it's been fun. I mean, don't get me wrong, frustrating at first, but now I'm starting to, like, just like love the process of it. And um, I also would want to travel again because um, ironically, right as 2020 began, I'm like, wow, I'm going to go travel. <laughs> oh, no, I was not. Uh, you know, <laughs> Where were you going to go? Um, I actually had a trip planned 
<clears throat> to Asia with my cousin. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um and I had to cancel it for other reasons, not the pandemic, but it kind of worked out that I had to. Right. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to do some traveling. I'd like to have my, uh, have my artwork published and, um, I'd like to do a little more of my passions also. And, um, if I have possible time and money, maybe I do, I may want to get that certification I was talking about with esthetician nursing mm-hmm. just cause, uh, you know, I, I did like the idea of, you know, in general, this is why I like nursing. I like being able to teach somebody something and also help them calm, help them be calmer in a very fearful situation, you know? Mm-hmm. Do you have any events that are coming up? Uh, events that are coming up? Uh, in terms see. of poetry and oh, literary poetry. work <laughs> or anything. anything. Um, actually, on the 15th uh, at Hub 17, which is 73 Wave Street. October uh, 15th. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, sorry, I'm old. Yeah, I just have to say it for the That's audience. Okay. <laughs> for whenever they watch this. Yeah. Um, but uh, I actually recently uh, worked with a few people. We call ourselves the Writer's Block. And I was part recently of a book where a bunch of people would get together monthly and we would write, whether it was poetry, short stories, whatever. And um, I'm going to be doing some readings there. Uh, some of the w- readings I will be doing will be included in the book. Others, hopefully, next book we do, because we do plan on making uh, this a yearly thing. And... Um, also, hopefully in the next year, uh, I do want to turn my recent uh, endeavors with painting into uh, some sort of exhibit. So hopefully stay tuned for that. Yeah. You know? Could you describe the paintings? What kind of style and what media are you using? Um, well, we are um, we're playing around with the paint right now. I don't want to go into too much. OK, now, OK. But um, but what I am hoping is to do different types of fluorescence and also um and also, I do want to use a little bit of geometric figures, but I mm. also uh, want to have some sort of, again, I don't want to give too much away, Okay. <laughs> um, but I do have an active cause that it's going to be tied to. So uh, one of the things that I do plan to do is uh, people that come into the exhibit, I want to make sure that they're aware that the proceeds don't just go to the art that they saw, but they also go to uh, the cause of, of, of my choosing. So. Ooh, that yeah, sounds wonderful. I will bring that up when it's time. I just don't want to, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say too much. Okay, I won't yeah. press you. I won't press you. Does Prince have any plans? Um, Prince, honestly, I think he just wants to uh, eat, sleep, and run around a lot. That's that's his thing. <laughs> and possibly cuddle with me. So <laughs> that's his thing. <laughs> what kind of dog is he? Oh, he's um he's a rescue, but uh, he's part Carn Terrier, which is, uh, if you don't know what kind of dog that is, think Toto from Wizard of Oz. Okay. And part Schnauzer, which is those dogs that tend to have, like, a little beard. Um, his hair is cut right now. That's why he doesn't have that little beard going. But you <laughs> notice he does have a little gray. That's just his coloring. He's only four. He's he's still a baby. Um, but I got him uh, back in May, and so I haven't had him for, for a full year yet, but I think he's definitely taken to me very well. You know, yeah, yeah, and uh, my parents jokingly say that's their grandson. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are running out of time, yeah. and I want audience members mm-hmm. to know where they can find you, how they can find you for any of your creative work, okay. and anything else if they're allowed yeah, yeah, to ask absolutely. you questions about nursing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, I have uh, a regular website, which is my full name, Carissa Pignatelli. If you want me to spell it, I absolutely will. But if you don't want me to do that, uh, my Instagram is a it lot in, easier. in all the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, I also have uh, my Instagram, which is um, Cap Loves You, C A P Loves You. And um, I post a lot there, and uh, I can definitely do a little more interacting if you want to say hello. So. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you so much, Carissa. You You really got vulnerable and shared sides of your profession that not everyone is willing to do. So (laughs) I greatly appreciate that. And I think what you do is so important. What all healthcare workers do is so important. Thank you. And I think it's also really beautiful that you make time for your creative endeavors, too. Thank you very much. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Well, dear folks, you've been watching (laughs) Badass Lady Folk. I'm your host, Christine Stoddard. Tune in next time.